So uh, welcome to, I think, what, what tonight is the 11th or maybe 12th uh, talk on our speaker series uh, here at the Sound Studies Institute. Uh, so for those of you who are uh, coming, uh, tuning in from somewhere else, so we're coming to you from Amskewache, uh, Wiskagen, uh, sometimes known as uh, Edmonton, Alberta. Uh, we're in Treaty 6 territory, which is the traditional territory of Indigenous people, including the Cree, Blackfoot, Métis, Dakota Sioux, Iroquois, Dene, Ojibwe, Inuit, and many others. Uh, today, it's the home of many diverse peoples, and we welcome you all here uh, this evening, virtual or otherwise. Um, and if I look a little red in the face this evening, uh, it's because um, I happen to be in my office for the first time in a long time at the university. I had to come down to do a little bit of work here um, and find myself uh, hosting from here this evening. And I have some orange tinted lights in my office. So it's causing me to look a little red in the face, but rest assured I'm feeling fine and happy to be here. Um, so for those who are attending for the first time, the Sound Studies Institute is a University of Alberta research institute. Uh, we support research and creative activities that centers around sound in any way, really. Uh, and uh, we're proud of being interdisciplinary um, and have a large collective of affiliated researchers doing really interesting work in sound. And you can read about the, some of those people on our website. Um, but uh, uh, we're really um, happy to, to be able to support that. And um, as part of that, we um, offer these, these talks on various topics around sound and music. Um, and uh, I wanna thank um, Oliver Rossi and Tom Merklinger and uh, Gail Mandrick this evening as well, who are uh, part of my team at SSI. And um, so, um, yeah, tonight uh, we're really happy to be welcoming um, uh, Brian Fota. Uh, who is uh, assistant professor in the Department of Music. Um, and to the extent that sound studies is an established field, uh, tonight's talk comes from an area of study that can lay claim to uh, the origin of sound studies in many ways, which has to do with an understanding how audio and music particularly is and has been distributed to audiences or consumers, if you will. Um, the history of, of how that works um, in a number of different aspects, um, connects to cultural studies as well. Um, and so Brian, um, who's, as I mentioned, is assistant professor here in popular music and media studies in our department. Um, he teaches um, uh, a lot of our popular music courses um, and uh, studies music industries um, and music radio, often from the interrelated uh, perspectives of cultural studies, history, and policy. Um, his new book, Music in Range, The Culture of Canadian Campus Radio, explores the history of Canadian campus radio, particularly highlighting the factors that have shaped its close relationship with local music and culture. He is currently a co-investigator on a shirk funded project um, that investigates copyright, uh, cultural labor, and monetization in the digital music industry uh, industries. And uh, tonight he's gonna be um, speaking about the streaming music era um, and uh, uh, issues around um, uh, equitable dis distribution amongst uh, independent artists. And I'm really, really excited to hear this talk. Um, as you all know, um, it's, a, it's a, a time of great transition in the music industry in terms of how um, music is commodified and distributed and, and monetized and how artists get paid for their work and how that can all happen while still having a um, you know a reasonable um, environment for uh, remi remixing each other's work and, and being able to um, to comment on each other's work in various ways. So it's a really complicated um, uh, world right now, and I'm happy to hear uh, Brian talk a little bit about it from this perspective. So um, let's welcome Brian, and I'll turn it over to you now. Thanks. Great, thanks, Scott. It's uh, nice to be on the other side. Uh, tonight and, and do some talking and I've enjoyed listening for you know a lot of these talks when I can it's it's sort of uh, toddler baby bedtime at this hour so sometimes I tune in a little late but nice to be on the, on the other side and as Scott mentioned um, I, I'm part of this collaborative research project that has been you know we should be done our, our grant but COVID has extended things so we're sort of 
pushing that uh, shirk money a little bit further and uh, maybe another year or so but uh, and I'll say more about that in a, in a moment um, and I'm going to kind of go back and forth between some slides today and playing a few clips from some of the artists I'll be talking about too um, and you know this is a research project that began before the pandemic um, but as we know COVID-19 has, has kind of led to this overnight collapse in the live concert market, of course, but also you know, altering the livelihood for many performing artists in uh, a, a number of ways, of course, too. Um, but our argument or, or what we've been finding is that the music industries in Canada um, were already sort of riven with fault lines uh, through which many of its most promising musicians were falling through the cracks. So. Our research precedes the pandemic, um, but anticipates many of the significant issues that have since been um, amplified. And this research project involves uh, myself, uh, Brianne Selman, a copyright librarian at the University of Winnipeg, um, and Andrew DeWard at the University of California, San Diego. We've had some great help from uh, research assistants, Dan Colusi at, at Winnipeg, and Will Northlich here at the U of A, as well as Anna Dundas Richter and Maria Kaner, two undergrad students who have been helping out uh, building spreadsheets and, and all sorts of things. Um, but today I'm gonna focus on a research paper we've been working on that involves interviews with uh, 17 or 18 uh, musicians, music artists who either live and perform or used to live and perform in Edmonton or in Winnipeg. Um, and though the focus of this research is Canada, it joins a number of recent articles that have been popping up over the last few years that are looking to make sense of or to position a nation's music industries um, and its independent musicians within the globalized streaming music era. So what happens as you know these big, big streaming platforms become the dominant mode of listening? What happens to things like geographic borders and, and the policies that shape how music is made um, within them. And what our paper hopes to add to the conversation here, which points to the title, the sort of sound from above and below, um, is this dual methodological approach using a combination of critical political economy and ethnography, um, interviews with musicians, drawing on some of the experiences of our RAs and ourselves um, who have been involved with the music industries in, in different ways. So I'm going to begin by talking a little bit about the political economy of Canadian music and this first part will be a little more um, stat heavy and then I'll move into some of the excerpts from um, our interviews and, and then some of the things we've been thinking about. How might we reimagine or re-envision uh, the music industries in Canada based on what some of these artists have been telling us. Okay, so many of the uh, world's regional music industries um, are increasingly affected by a, a tight oligopoly of transnational, mostly American music technology and financial companies. Um, so the political economy of music is shaped by only two or three massive conglomerates um, in each subsector. And in many ways, this shapes the opportunities for musicians of all stripes. Um, so in music and publishing, you have the big three now, which when I was an undergrad, I think it was a big five, but we've gone from five to four to the three of Universal Music Group, Sony Music Group, and Warner. So these three companies now largely dominating the industry and they have their Canadian um, subsidiaries, of course. And reports range from these companies controlling at least 70% of the music and publishing industries globally in 2019, to as high as 86% in the North American recording and publishing market in 2016. Now, of course, a lot of music now is you know, disassociated from needing to engage with the material or the physical, right? There's new ways to record and produce and distribute music um, using all sorts of digital technologies and, and internet services and what have you. But as many of you know, especially 
if you're a musician or if you kind of follow um, news in the tech and music industries, um, Spotify's payment model um, is, is not something that has been incredibly lucrative. Most of the streaming services aren't. Um, it's a payment model that favors these big labels that have many clients and extensive catalogs, um, while often disadvantaging independent and smaller musicians and labels who don't have that comparative scale. And as some other writers have pointed out recently, people like um, Patrick Vonderoe, whose Spotify teardown or takedown book kind of gets into the mechanics of, of the black box of algorithms and what have you. Um, Robert Praise, another individual. Um, as some of these writers have pointed out, the company is not just a, a music service. In fact, you know, that's very little of, of what it actually does. Um, it sort of operates at this intersection of advertising, technology, music, and finance. So it's often more concerned with sort of projecting future profits as it kind of brings on debt. Um, and, and often this means the music component is left um, to the side, to the wayside. Something that's made a lot of noise recently, uh, you may have been um, you know, paying attention to some of these headlines. I think there was one last week or a week ago that said, you know, Bob Dylan and Taylor Swift are a hot new asset class uh, these days. And this is that we have investment groups such as Hypnosis, um, Songs Fund, acquiring recording and publishing rights um, in an effort to turn catalogs of songs into um, speculative, in, speculative investment grade assets. Um, and you know, there's been a lot of talk about, does this have to do with certain artists, legacy artists like Neil Young, not having that big tour revenue, wanting a company to help place his music in different places um, and whatnot, but sort of giving us a sense of music as, as more about um, an asset as opposed to you know, a piece of art, a piece of music. And the big three labels I mentioned before have enacted internal strategies of financialization, um, such as leveraging these back catalogs in order to gain equity stakes in streaming music companies like Spotify, of course, but also um, smaller ones like SoundCloud. And this strategy uh, requires no sharing of royalties with artists um, and these big three labels operate their own venture capital funds, as do all major media companies. So that's sort of giving us a sense of what's going on at the level of the record industry, the labels. When we think about the artists and you know, how certain artists are, are profitable in the streaming media era, there are also big imbalances of revenues with respect to a profitable few in the contemporary music industries and the performing many, if you will. So one recent Citigroup report found that the U.S. music industry generated uh, $43 billion U.S in 2017, but artists received only 12% of this. Within that 12%, there's inequality amongst these artists, and it seems to be worsening. The top 1% of artists accounted for 77% of all recorded music income in 2014, and by 2020, the top 1% was accounting for 90% of streams and the top 10% of artists accounted for 99.4%. So that's fairly stark um, in terms of how small um, the successful few are in terms of um, the, the, the number of streams and then the, the way those royalties are being paid out to artists, right? You really need to be a top heavy artist to be profitable on a service uh, like Spotify. And if we looked at something like the Canadian radio sector, um, a few years ago, the president of ReSound Music Licensing in Canada noted that in 1997, 50% uh, of the Canadian rec radio sector was in the hands of 10 radio groups, and by 2018, it was 82%. So that can do things like lead to centralized and syndicated playlists across a number of local stations um, that one company might own. So, you know, this even happened in the talk 
news landscape not too long ago with a number of TSN radio stations being um, kind of getting rid of personnel, getting rid of local coverage, and bringing in kind of syndicated packaged comedy programs. So it's not just music that this is taking place in. Um, Canada also has one of the highest rates of major label market share in the world at 75%. Um, only Spain, Denmark, and the UK have a higher rate, or, or Nor Norway as well to um, a, s a small extent there, I think, unless they're tied. Um, hopefully you can see that on, on the chart there. And this means, too, that Canada has one of the lowest, um, lowest rates of independent record label market share at 25% with the global average being about 40, 40%, right? So that those bigger labels um, having much more control in, in what is a fairly small country population wise, um, but our cities, our towns are, are fairly spread out and each of these has their own kind of local music culture, of course, uh, that we wanna pay attention to. Now, as many of you probably know too, um, you know, if you're looking at just the numbers, the stats in terms of how successful Canada might look at the level of the industry um, across the globe, um, it might look quite rosy uh, because three of the uh, biggest global streaming superstars are Canadian. Um, and this is Drake, The Weeknd, and Justin Bieber, sort of in reverse order there, but I'm sure you recognize at least one of them, if, if not all three. Um, and from 20, 2005 to 2017, um, according to both Nielsen and Billboard, these three artists had the most top, sorry, the, had the top eight most streamed songs of Canadian musicians, 31 of the top 50, and 72 of the top 150. And Drake seems to break new Billboard records every year. As of 2020, he has the most career entries. Uh, 224 on Billboard's Hot 100 chart, the most top 40 hits um, at 113, and the most top 10 hits, 40 um, in total, more than Madonna, Michael Jackson, and the Beatles. So in the streaming era, big hits get increasingly bigger, leaving little room uh, for smaller hit songs. So what might appear as a profitable, vibrant industry from baseline numbers is in fact dominated by these three musicians, um, all of whom are assigned to the US-based Universal Music Group. And here we see the amount of songs on the top 100 singles charts since 1967. Um, the 1990s, kind of the height of the CD boom, um, as well as you know, kind of CanCon radio re regulations really coming into fruition, um, things like Much Music being an active channel in breaking um, singles, you know, witnessed arguably a more diverse range of Canadian musicians uh, making popular music that reached a wide audience. So that blue, um, as the legend shows, um, is giving us a sense of the hit songs performed by Drake Justin Bieber and The Weeknd. Um, so some of those years, like 2016, for instance, um, you know, over half of those top 100 singles are by those three artists. Um, and as we get even closer to today, uh, that blue portion is taking up uh, a much bigger percentage of those charts. We're missing a bit of data here. Um, some of you may be familiar with RPM Magazine, a magazine that used to report on the Canadian music industries. Um, it sort of stopped in 1999, and then Billboard starts uh, keeping tabs on Canada in, in 2008. But I don't doubt that you know, we'd see something similar within those years there, to 2002 and 2008 probably. Now if we think about kind of the regional inequalities by different provinces or cities. Um, this is something, this, these kind of gaps between big centers and smaller centers, if you will, are widening as well. Um, Ontario, particularly the cultural hub of Toronto, 
um, has a disproportionate significance within the Canadian music industries with nearly half of music sector jobs nationwide. Um, over 60% of Canadian music publishing and recording export revenue and 58% of the Canadian total GDP generated by the music sector as of uh, 2017. So you can maybe see Alberta there, the little small green hump, um, but maybe not. And I mean, this makes sense in, in some ways. Toronto's a big center. A lot of the record label subsidiaries set up shop there in the 90s. Um, but we do have some stats too that kind of put this in perspective with percentage of population um, that I'll show in a moment. So here's the, the chart that indicates the, the jobs in Canadian sound recording industries. So a pretty big gap there between Ontario um, and smaller provinces like Alberta and Manitoba. So in some ways, uh, government grants can help to mitigate this imbalance. Um, but in the case of grants awarded by Factor, the foundation um, assisting Canadian talent on recordings, um, if we look at the um, percentage of grants awarded to musicians and music companies from, this is from 2013 to 2020, uh, more than half that total money went to Ontario musicians, despite the province having less than 40% of the population. Um, so correspondingly, other provinces and territories uh, receive um, a disproportionately lower amount of funding compared to their population. So this is part of the reason we're kind of interested in looking at places like Alberta and Manitoba, where that percentage of population is much higher um, than the funding we received. Um, something that's probably not likely to get any better over the next few years. Oops. So a few more stats before I move on to the next section. Um, in Canada, the average musician makes um, 17,900 a year, less than half the average Canadian worker's income and well below the poverty line. So it, you know, the picture is that it's more winner take all in the music industries than, than ever before. So with this overview of the political, political economy of Canadian music, um, it's clear that independent musicians face um, undue hardship in pursuing their career. So our next step, sort of turning to some musicians themselves, um, listening to their perspectives and values um, in order to hopefully advocate on their behalf. So to get a sense of how artists in Canada have been navigating their careers, um, we interviewed musicians in Edmonton and Winnipeg. Um, these cities were chosen for uh, practical reasons. I'm in Edmonton and, and Brienne is in Winnipeg. Um, but also to call attention to cities that are infrequently the focus of writing on music in Canada. Um, studies of music making in Canada predominantly focus on larger cities um, like Toronto and Montreal, cities with more venues and businesses like record labels, um, publishers, and radio stations. An independent, you know, sort of just to give us a sense of how we're using this term, it's kind of fluid, it means different things to different people. Um, we're sort of thinking of it as a fluid and imperfect category, but one that uh, we kind of use throughout this research to describe artists who are working with some idea of creative autonomy and or music making that operates at some distance from the major record industry. But many of these artists have moved from you know, different levels of this spectrum throughout their career. Um, the important thing was that at some point they'd had this perspective to um, bring kind of to the table um, in, our, in our interviews. So these interviews highlighted three aspects of the artist's experience or perspective um, that are particularly relevant for analyzing that political economy of music in Canada, some the stuff that I kind of just went over. Um, and the three things we isolated here were the size and scale of the record industry in Canada, touring and geography, and grants and funding. So I'm gonna work through these sections, um, but I'm also gonna stop the screen share for a while so I can play a minute or so of a couple artists just to um, 
break the talking up a little and, and give a sense of the music that some of these performers uh, make. It's not all of them, and the songs were basically chosen for where the interviews kind of fall in the talk so that it kind of gives us a nice uh, break from time to time here. So let's make sure I have that ready to go. Okay, so beginning with um, the size and scale of the Canadian record industry. Because our interview subjects either live or have lived in the mid-sized cities of Winnipeg and, and Edmonton, there's often a career trajectory here that involves uh, moving to a larger city where more infrastructure and music businesses are located. Some interviewees mention the ability to find more work opportunities in bigger cities and that there is a better chance of having a gatekeeper, if you will, somebody uh, like a serious XM programmer um, who has been kind of an important figure for a number of these artists for some reasons uh, I'll talk about shortly, um, to have one of these individuals present at a live performance in Toronto. So both Colleen Brown and Kaylee Thomas are singers, songwriters, and instrumentalists um, who moved to Toronto from Edmonton. Brown commented on the increased prominence of the business side of music in Toronto and explained that, quote, it just felt like every time I watched an artist build up in Edmonton, there would be some kind of wall where it just wouldn't build past a certain point. So kind of pointing to, the, to a lack of infrastructure to some extent. And I'm going to play about a minute here of a recent song by Colleen Brown called It's the End of the World Again off of a new album called Isolation Songs, um, just to kind of set the stage here uh, for a minute or so. And we didn't test the audio, so if it's too loud or too quiet, just let me know in the chat. called It's the End of the World Again um, by Colleen Brown. Okay. So jumping back into size and scale of the industry, um, another thing that some pointed out was that the process of kind of becoming acquainted with different levels or tiers of the music business um, was tricky. And for many musicians now, there's kind of a, a need to be strategic with respect to deciding when to establish partnerships with labels or other industry intermediaries like a publicist um, and how much of their own money to spend. So I think as things become more kind of entrepreneurial, this work of figuring this out and doing this budgeting um, is being downloaded onto um, artists. So some said that often these part partnerships are set in place for the album release cycle and then paused or stopped until the next one. Um, one indie solo artist from Edmonton who uh, wished to remain uh, anonymous um, mentioned that her publicist was the most expensive line on her marketing budget um, but had felt that little return had, had come from this expense. Um, Marty Sarbit, vocalist and songwriter of Imaginary Cities and Lanakai, explained that a manager was essential for putting together grant applications. This perceived requirement to participate in kind of the industry in a specific way um, can be a significant obstacle for many. Kelly Frazier, a beloved Inuk pop singer and Juno Award nominee, um, who has since sadly passed away, indicated that forms of institutional racism could be a barrier for participating with labels, an issue she connected to a longer history of colonialism in Canada. She said, I don't know if labels that are mostly run um, by white people or people who live in the West with Western ideologies and values, I don't think they'd be able to see what I'm trying to do, trying to teach. She did try to work with a label for her album Sedna, but the label requested that she sing only in her language, and she wanted to sing half in English and half in Inuktitut because that is how she teaches. She decided not to work with the label, giving their efforts to control um, her practice. 
So I'm going to play just 30 seconds of a song by Kelly. And this one, for those who it may not work for, is called Sedna, S-E-D-N-A, off the album Sedna. Okay, so the next section, uh, touring and geography in Canada. So today, uh, much artist revenue has to be sustained um, by aggressive touring, an option that is not accessible to everyone. Um, one group, the Creative Independent, who is a sort of collection of writers out of the U.S., um, and they do some music industry studies, indicated that most musicians in the U.S. are not able to earn a living wage through music-related work, with most income coming from uh, fees for performing and touring at 61%. A study on the music ecosystem in Alberta uh, that was done recently by uh, the West Anthem uh, group noted that 73% of artist income comes from performance and touring. And the future of music out of DC, Washington DC, found that the income derived from sound recordings is a small part of a musician's overall revenue pie and it's decreasing. The increasing em emphasis on live music within a musician's workload uh, raises issues for those in Canada, given its vast geographic area and low population. You know, if you're thinking too about touring in the winter, if you have to go from Edmonton to Vancouver, it's, it's not even particularly safe. Musicians living and working in the Northern Territories have an especially difficult time touring, facing long distances and expensive travel options. Although streaming services help reach audiences beyond borders, it forces musicians to rely on live shows and touring to generate an income, as opposed to selling albums. Some artists noticed, noted the increasing importance of festivals and showcases in which one can spend a few days in one area and perform and network with the hopes of building a team um, in that sort of setting. Uh, some felt that it's difficult, if not pointless, to tour across Canada, finding it more effective to fly to a different region, visit a number of towns and cities in that area. In most cases, artists emphasized the necessity of touring, although the financial return of this endeavor varied across responses. Lee Klippenstein of Edmonton-based uh, bands Slates and Screaming Targets said that for his bands, it's usually a 50-50 split between show sales and records and merch sales. And that's almost strictly vinyl, he said. He added that live shows and merch sales have been really the only thing to sustain them. John K. Sampson, a singer-songwriter and member of the Juno-nominated indie rock band The Weakerlands, said that most of his income comes from live revenue, but when he plays with a full band, he makes what the band makes, and it's not very much. So I'll play us... Uh, actually, I'll skip over um, this one just because... I'm looking at time too. So while it was a shared sentiment that streaming music services are largely useless when it comes to financial compensation, some noted the advantages of using, listen using listener data when it comes to organizing shows and tours. Given both the range of income artists generate from live shows and the geographic and weather-based complications with touring Canada, um, the logistics and planning um, of live performances is a fundamental aspect of one's career. And one of the most striking takeaways from this artist's perspective on touring um, is that these financial and geographic obstacles can determine the sound of the music performed. Um, so Kaylee Thomas indicated that her recordings are quite layered and she's often thought, quote, oh, why did I have to include a vibraphone? How to pare that down because it's a big thing. I guess, to create a product that you can recreate with as little resources as necessary. Similarly, um, Nathaniel Felicitas, a freelance cellist, said that it's cheaper for just one person to fly there and tour Eastern Canada with the Eastern string players as opposed to bringing me along. So genre plays a role in determining uh, one's ability to tour and perform in smaller centers and towns as well. 
Josh Shahunta, an Edmonton-based R&B and pop singer-songwriter, said that because he fits within the genre of easy listening, he can get a wide variety of bookings because his music, quote, is not really something that would be off-putting in any setting. So ultimately, the sound of the music one hears in a live music context is shaped by these financial and logistic realities. And these obstacles are arguably more prominent for new and independent artists. Certain genres and styles of music that lend themselves to solo artists um, or smaller outfits seem to travel more efficiently. And this reflects you know, somebody like Liz Pally's writing on the prominence of chill playlists um, or a music turned quote, emotional wallpaper on Spotify and their articulation with a distracted, overworked and anxious listening context. So not only are these platform technologies um, shaping the music we hear, but variable musician incomes and industry infrastructures are modifying the music we hear in live settings as well. Okay, so the last section of, of this section, government grants and funding. One opportunity for artists in a Canadian context is a fairly robust uh, funding framework for musical activities, including recording, promotion, and touring. Sahunta described grants as invaluable and has used them for all sorts of things like tours, showcases, and recording. But by no means is this, is this a perfect uh, framework. Um, a number of musicians emphasize, um, but even still, a number of musicians emphasize the reliability of grants as a significant source of capital. One folk singer-songwriter in Alberta who recently won a Juno said that, that most funding I get fr is from grants. I would say that 50% of them are Indigenous-based grants and that money goes through travel and towards creating new albums. And grants range from those provided by local organizations such as municipalities, radio stations and banks to those at the provincial and federal level. Um, typically, the more local the grant, the easier it is to acquire. Um, so Lee Klippenstein, for instance, said that uh, most of his most expensive recordings were financed through radio station grant programs here that uh, were from stations that didn't play any music even close to what they were uh, recording, but that it was a fairly easy grant to get. Whereas the larger ones, the big, big ones from Factor, um, are more difficult to acquire and they often require assistance as well as the artist putting up money themselves in advance. One thing we found that within a larger arts funding context is that there's been this turn to kind of instrumentalized benchmarks for acquiring or justifying grants. So things like, you know, how many records have you sold, will you sold, and so on. A common sentiment was that grants tend to privilege, quote, the people who are more strategic and less artistically driven. Others bemoan the fact that Facebook likes and YouTube views become part of the criteria for successful grant applications. Greg McPherson, a Winnipeg singer-songwriter and co-owner of indie record label Disintegration Records, raised questions of what sort of music might get funded if we circumvented ideas about instrumental return explaining that Manitoba is, quote, too focused on the notion of building an industry here. He said he would love to see that support going to something weird, going to Indigenous DJs, or going to some weird electronic music from the PA, or something that's different and unique. And I'll just play a quick excerpt of a song uh, by Greg McPherson, called Frequencies Off of Disintegration Blues. <laughs> Some part of me's evil, you should try not to believe it though, all right. Some kind of natural order, jacked up loud, and on the verge of distortion every time. So now I'm going to quickly move us to this next section, um, and this is one where we um, kind of take some of these findings from these interviews and think about places where we might focus attention and energy in thinking about how we might restructure or reimagine the music industries in the streaming media era. This includes sustainability for musicians, infrastructure, sustainable infrastructure, and transparency and community. 
So for the first point here, um, I'll go through these sections quite quickly actually, because um, I want to get to a conclusion and, and hear some questions too if there are some. But something like a sustainable music career is defined differently by different musicians, of course. For some, you know, the ability to play music and tour and break even is the ultimate goal. You know, maybe there's a another job that, that one is doing. For others, the aim is to make a living wage off playing and recording music. Um, as one artist claimed, the desire to, quote, put art in the world that I think is meaningful often means having to make money to survive and to sustain oneself. Another defined a sustainable career as paying rent, paying my bills, having a decent standard of living, being able to afford to take care of my child. Sorry. Uh, many interviewees stressed the uh, toll the ma music making and the increased pressure uh, to carry out a wide variety of tasks and jobs related to their career can have on their mental health. So things like keeping up with Instagram posts and what have you. Also, the standards and structures set by the music business um, can be difficult to conform to and they often work against one's artistic uh, sensibility. Arlo Maverick, an Edmonton-based hip-hop MC, commented on the increased pressure to re release singles more regularly, but that he has always kind of seen himself as an album artist. The entrepreneurial nature of a musician's creative labor uh, reflects the variety of income streams that any one artist might re um, require in order to maintain or work towards a sustainable career. Um, so there's all sorts of places people are, are kind of getting money. Um, royalties from radio, money from sync and licensing deals, adjacent income, like working a second job, um, and streaming music royalties were some of the most frequently cited. Sound exchange, um, which some of you may know, um, deals and royalties from streaming radio, like Sirius XM, internet radio, um, was said to pay more than most other royalties. Um, especially in Canada, because there's a certain amount of Canadian stations that um, need to be there, because it was licensed um, here in Canada. Fraser explained that one large check from sound exchange and performance rights was notably significant, enough to pay bills, build credit, buy a new car, pay for my own recordings, and even pay her sister's bills and help her family out more. So even though radio could still pay more, um, many found this sort of sound exchange stream to be quite profitable. That's why that serious XM performer, um, sorry, programmer from earlier was so important. A less reliable source of income has been per stream payouts from streaming music. Um, so there's a paradox there between the dominance of these services the pressure artists feel to have their music featured on playlists um, and then the payouts they receive. Though some artists did point out there was one band who got a song on a heavy metal workout playlist and that was quite lucrative for a brief period of time. So the second point, sustainable infrastructure. Um, so this includes institutions and resources that are essential for music making, uh, venues, cultural intermediaries, local media. Um, there's a key component of this there's been the issue of sustaining venues. I saw in the chat too, somebody pointing out the threat of COVID with respect to venues is, is huge, huge, huge. Um, but also things like ensuring live music and spaces and festivals are inclusive and accessible. Local media and journalists are strong advocates for local musicians, um, but this is a resource that has nearly disappeared from music cities in Canada and beyond. Um, you know, there's some great gems like CKUA here and campus radio across Canada, um, you know, certain publications still, but that a lot of local reporters working for big papers like the Edmonton Journal um, were no longer in these positions. Other components that artists indicated were missing or lacking were things like, quote, more community organizations like resource centers to help figure things out like contracts, um, continue building on the strides made in the last five years to support Indigenous work, and mental health, health aid for artists is massively needed um, because, as one artist put it, music is such a personal endeavor that if things don't go well, it can get dark. So the third, transparency and community. A lack of transparency across components of the industry was another recurrent issue expressed by interviewees. Um, there's sort of this 
veil of uncertainty that permeates an artist's relationship with people and things that are essential to their careers, including but not limited to labels, contracts, grants, and playlists. Klippenstein mentioned that one label was, quote, reluctant to even tell us what records had sold, and there was little sense of what money was coming in from streaming music services. Brown cited the importance of transparency when dealing with contracts, um, but noted that it's expensive to hire an entertainment lawyer. Okay, I'm going to conclude now, although it's kind of a long conclusion, not too long though. Um, so this is kind of us thinking about suggestions, and some of these are works in progress, ideas, um, looking for feedback, things like that. Um, and, and it's based on what interviews kind of left us with, right? Some of their suggestions, other things we've been thinking about in relation to that kind of political economy component. So three things. One, advocating for um, policies, structures, and practices that prioritize a broad and diverse working class or class of working musicians, not just superstars. Two, using government support to achieve uh, sustainability for both an artist's livelihood as well as for music infrastructure that is not monopolistic. And three, shift emphasis away from market-oriented, um, profit-based consumptions of music and thinking about ways to enhance the community-based, um, care-informed model of music. So let's say a few points about these three things and then uh, wrap it up. So for the first one, um, as Jed Gauthier from Counterfeit Jeans said in reference to the difficulties of a working musician, if music becomes something that people just do as a hobby, you're going to lose a whole bunch of voices in music because you're just going to have the people who can afford to pursue music careers. So we encourage increased funding at the municipal, provincial and federal levels. The metrics for which artists qualify for grants should be restructured so as to allow for a wider diversity of artists to receive support with less focus on uh, discriminatory markers like proper grammar. That was one issue that uh, one artist noted was that their grant was kind of uh, dismissed due to uh, their inability to, to write at the level that was required. The grant writing process could be subsidized um, as the current process sort of favors the educated and well-connected um, thinking too about positive relationships between federal and local organizations um, in efforts to decentralize the music business in Canada and strengthen musical and cultural activities across the country. Um, or bolder yet, this patchwork of go government funding initiatives could be replaced with you know, different strategies around universal basic income for working musicians um, who may be able to demonstrate some minimal level of product productivity and fandom. On the second point, cultivating an equitable music infrastructure, we started to take some in inspiration here from the campus community radio sector in Canada, which is nonprofit and regulated, um, so as to program Canadian local and varied music. And we imagined some scenarios where some live music venues might operate as nonprofit organizations that would be kind of showcasing. Um, independent diverse artists that have a mandate kind of like campus stations do. Um, they could even be potentially linked up to campus and community radio stations um, serving as a reliable venue for radio programmers and volunteers to organize shows um, within regions and localities. Thinking too of you know Canadian content development in the way that big commercial stations um, with annual revenue over a million, 250,000, the way that they contribute to the community radio fund, Factor, Music Action. We could see similar things with, you know, big entertainment complexes, um, you know, having some sort of support system in place for smaller uh, nonprofit music venues to ensure that our cities have a, a variety of, of, of things to do in the arts sector. Also, given the dominance of music listening on Spotify and Apple Music in Canada and the increasing importance of playlist inclusion, um, it's seeming more and more like we might need regulation that mandates uh, a wider variety of Canadian artists on playlists um, for the major streaming companies. So algorithmic bias towards certain, um, you know, kind of mostly corporate larger artists um, already exists. So now might be the time to implement local, regional, independent and diversity mandates. And this is something that you, know, you see in the news right now 
um, playing out in a variety of ways with respect to uh, tech companies. <clears throat> and for the last one, um, as tech uh, platforms become more entrenched in our daily and cultural lives, their designations, designation as a utility becomes more appropriate. Um, so public nonprofit approaches to streaming should be considered one that privileges you know, community and sustaining working musicians um, over non-Canadian uh, corporate profits. So Capital City Records here in Edmonton through the library is an interesting example of a digital public space um, that could be used as a model. You know, it, it's not there paying artists in a way that um, kind of connects to the sustainable livelihoods, but it's an example of streaming services that are operating with some idea of the public good in place. Um, and that's been getting a bit more traction lately. People are writing on that. There's many more libraries with streaming services across North America um, right now. So thinking about ways that listeners, artists, and cities could be connected through um, public spaces. So COVID-19 is an unmitigated disaster for Canadian, Canada's music culture. Um, the songs that will never be recorded and the live concerts that will never be staged are a dramatic loss for our nation's heritage. But as, but as it has been in many sectors, the pandemic is also an opportunity to rethink what is most essential and how our structures do or do not support those essential workers and values. New space is open to consider alternatives to what were already ossified unequal industries. The Canadian music industries are ripe for revitalization. The pandemic has been like water that has seeped into every fault line of the modern world. Now is the time to plant seeds in those cracks for the regrowth of what is most important. Thanks. Lovely, thank you so much, Brian, that was great. And uh, um, I can see the applause. I can't hear it. Yes, I can, right? I really listen, maybe I can hear it. Um, yeah, that was that was good. Uh, really interesting talk. So many questions. Um, just to, to say this quickly, I know some some of you probably saw this in the chat, but um, we will be posting this talk uh, on our YouTube channel. Um, and uh, if there's any problem with uh, the version that we recorded with uh, examples, we'll make sure those get dubbed in as well. But um, so yeah, um, I think uh, we have we have time for questions. Uh, let me just say, um, or I should say. We do normally end at eight o'clock, um, uh, but then as some of you come before you know this, we often go over it, uh, at least until uh, 8.15, sometimes 8.30 with extra questions. So I do wanna say since it is right um, on the dot right now, uh, almost eight o'clock, um, I'll just say for those who do have to leave um, that it was great to have you here and thank you all for coming tonight. Um, and our next event, um, will be um, Ardell Reese, who's going to be talking about um, uh, this, her, her talk is called Singability, the Essential Service to the Soul, um, where she'll be talking um, about um, uh, in the midst of the uh, pandemic, um, along with uh, many other choirs, um, talking about uh, some work that she's been doing um, with choirs to help people express themselves through music. So this should be um, a really uplifting uh, talk um, and that will be on March 24th, um, Wednesday at our normal time at 7 p.m. So I hope everyone, I uh, hope you can make it if you're interested in that. And uh, yeah, let's please. So what we'll do here is if you have a question, um, you can raise your hand um, or you can post it in the chat and Tom will help me navigate uh, what's happened so far. And I do see that there are a couple of uh, Monique uh, is talking a little bit about profit-based, the profit-based market and dealing with inequities and in streaming uh, artists in, in Canada, being able to receive streaming income. Uh, uh, Monique, would you like to express your question um, directly? Or I, I know that Brian can see what's in the chat there as well, but if you, if you wanted to clarify anything, please do. Oh, I just wanted to share the petition and, and that's one of the reasons why I was so excited to be here uh, because I started the petition a few months ago and just sort of, I just left it sit, but there's already 742 signatures. I didn't really do that much and more or less all the things I'm saying are the things that you're addressing in this talk. So I just wanted to share that. Oh, and thank okay. you so much for doing this. So uh, if you're interested at all, please do check it out. Great, thanks. I just opened the link and I'll, I'll take a look. Closer. Yeah, yeah. And, and I'll post all this for the, your your link to this talk to my students and uh, uh, all the people that I'm in contact with. So thank great. you. That's great. Thanks. That's great. Um, 
So I see um, there's a great question here on Bandcamp, and actually I want to I want to glom onto that question um, and say. Uh, so the, the question is really, are, do you have thoughts on Bandcamp and how it functions in this landscape? Um, uh, and, uh, but also, um, I'm also curious about the, the sort of the practice that I've noticed that a lot of people are doing on Bandcamp and elsewhere, including myself, but um, is offering limited edition physical media um, for, because there is still a market for that, even though it's a niche market and, and maybe it's becoming a bit elitist even, I hate to say that, but in, in nevertheless, it's still a really interesting approach. And I wondered if, so I wanted to, I was wondering if you had any information on um, uh, how widespread that is as a practice, but I'm also interested in the gener general comments you might have about Bandcamp and, uh, and how it has uh, contributed or not to this. Yeah, that's a, a great question, and it's one that has been on my mind over the last year because, you know, for a number of reasons, I think, you know, I don't think that Bandcamp alone is the answer, but I think more options that reflect what Bandcamp does is a step in the right direction. I think that being able to have systems that pay a higher proportion of one's contribution to an artist is incredibly important um, and Bandcamp allows that and I think that they have you know ideas about community in mind there's still a, a, a tech platform of course um, but I think it's one that is much more equitable and I think what they've done really successfully over the last year is been part of Kind of a larger campaign to let people know that your money you know matters and that only a fraction of what you might pay for a subscription service with certain services make it to an artist and that if you buy a four five six dollar digital album off Bandcamp, that that's going to go much further for an artist and i think that it's not users fault you're going to do what is easy and convenient. That's you know natural. There's a long history of music listening that that is that. Um, but I think creating awareness can go a long way too, because I know a lot of people do want to support artists. And if we have more options, it's easier to sort of spread your listening out and and sort of to make purchases across a variety of platforms that that can uh, be beneficial for for artists and you know, them waving their profits on Bandcamp Fridays was a great way to build that awareness and a lot of labels jumped on board and waved their profits and I, I saw a number of stats from um, certain artists who had done pretty well through Bandcamp and, and it didn't take as many people. It's not, it, it doesn't have that same critical mass of listeners, but it kind of builds fan communities in, in sort of an old school way, I guess, where you can kind of, you know, support and follow certain artists and they have a kind of clunky app that kind of works for streaming music. It's not perfect, but um, you do see a, a bigger percentage of, of revenues going to artists. And I think that's great. And I think having more options is um, essential for, for thinking about ways forward um, as well. So, yeah. Great. Thank you for that. Uh, let's see, I'm going back here. Um, a couple of comments. Um, and uh, Tom has an infrastructure question, which is not typed in. So Tom, would you like to ask your question? Sure. I know, I guess it won't let me start video. Sure. Yeah, we can hear Oh, you. there we go. Yeah. Okay. Hey, Tom. So um, you mentioned, you're talking about how live in Canada is a bit of a, of a difficult thing, especially in winter. You gave the example of Edmonton to Vancouver. Um, and you also mentioned how live is, of course, a very important part of a musician's income these days because of the way the economy, the music economy is changing. So when you get to infrastructure, um, I was sort of expecting something on that because you're very, I think you're very early on in your slides, you meant show the bar graph of independent versus uh, major label sales in various countries. And there are two very standout countries in that. Uh, one of them being Japan, the other being South Korea. Now, obviously, I can't speak for South Korea or even Japan for that matter. But one of the things in Japan is uh, the transit infrastructure is very heavily used by musicians to move around. And of course, it is helped by a dense population 
and whatnot. But, you know, so obviously Canada is a different situation, but I was wondering if you ever considered that um, any sort of inf infrastructure or systems for musicians to travel more easily, say, from Edmonton to Vancouver in, in the winter is, is, is part of the solution to this. Yeah, I mean, that's a, a great component of that kind of sustainable infrastructure question. And we do have a few more examples in, in the paper, but haven't totally got into the, um, you know, what would infrastructure be for kind of long, longer tours um, across bigger cities in a, a, a country like Canada. I think, you know, investments in things like public transit locally, but also connecting cities that are further apart would go a very long way in, in sort of helping to overcome those difficulties. Um, so I think that that's a, an excellent component to, to include in this as well. Um, and I think that, you know, we've kind of focused attention on what would it mean to have you know, infrastructure, music infrastructure spread out a little more across the country and maybe artists wouldn't need to go such a great distance in order to to find um, substantial revenues. You may have more opportunities, even in a regional level, potentially, and, and that sort of thing. So I think that that's a, a great component to, to add to um, the equation. I think that slide from before was pointing more to the, um, the market share of major versus independent labels, but I think your point is that we can extrapolate that out to other forms of in infrastructure, things like public transit. Um, that's a great point. Um, I see a question here from Fabio, um, uh, wondering about um, the dissemination of the of the writing. If you're if you're expecting this will be read um, by policymakers or hoping that it will be. Yeah, great question, uh, Fabio. We. We have done some other work related to this. Actually, um, my colleague Brianne just led the charge on a, um, a second sort of submission I'll, I'll post here um, with respect to copyright term extensions. We did one submission to the Standing Committee of um, Cultural Heritage in 2018, um, kind of arguing against the music industry lobbies for um, extending terms from 50 to, to 70 years uh, or death plus 50 to death plus 70 years um, in Canada and trying to put smaller scale artists and users in focus. So we've you know, presented in front of Parliament and, and written these two briefs. The one I just posted is the most recent. Um, you know, we had, they cited us like once or something. I think they're more swayed by the bigger lobbyists, but we try to make some noise. Um, the research from this paper we are hoping to turn into a more kind of public facing piece as well making this open access as well um, so there's that policy element that we have been involved with but you know, getting this research out in kind of a more kind of public venue as well will be uh, one of our next steps so um, this journal article will be open source but even still a lot of people don't don't read those. So uh, making something that's a little bit more public facing will, will uh, be probably over the next few months too. Great question. Great. Um, let's see if we have any more. I actually have a have a question that has to do with your um, the some of the stats you are you're reading about um, uh, sort of what a salary, a livable salary is for a musician um, or, or what they've reported be, um, having as income. And I, I've been curious about, um, about this from the point of view of how that's looked at in the totality. I mean, I, I know that for example, um, in the US, uh, which is where I'm from, uh, it's depending on what state you live in, I guess, but in a lot of states in the US, it's really, just literally impossible to live on an artist's salary, to, to live off of grants um, uh, because of healthcare. And uh, there's, and that, and that sort of, that healthcare question is different in every country. And so it's hard to quantify this, but I wondered if, I'm just wondering if looking at those statistics, if those kinds of things are taken into account um, and, and how, 
uh, like what you've what you found in, in terms of availability of healthcare uh, here in Canada is such a blessing uh, that 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 exists. And, and in, in some cases, I was surprised to learn that you could live as an independent artist in Canada, maybe very difficult, uh, very difficult life, but still it's kind of possible here. Uh, at least that's my sense compared to back home. So anyway, I'm just curious about that. Yeah, 70, uh, Tom, I think you're right. It was 17K and yeah, thanks. Yeah, 17,900. Um, 17, and yeah, I'd be happy to share um, some of the links and, and um, stats that we, we pulled for a lot of this. Um, you know, some of it was, some of the stats were from uh, the US. So the um, Future of Music Coalition, although it's a little dated now, they did a full study on artist revenue streams and it gets into um, some of that information and some of the Canadian ones as you, I'm just trying to see if I can find those links now, but I may have to dig them up later. Um, some of the Canadian ones, yeah, it is a very different situation because you don't have that um, healthcare equation. So um, what the future of music one emphasized much more was the necessity of adjacent income and a lot of these individuals were still kind of claiming music-based income, but it was through education, like music teaching and things like that, um, to maybe get those benefits if it was through an official um, organization or to make enough money on the side to sort of um, be able to cover that. But, but Future Music has been a, a huge advocate for um, working through questions of things like having access to healthcare for musicians and kind of getting involved in these uh, policy hearings and what have you. Um, and the state to state thing is, is big. Um, you know, in Canada, even though I'm pointing out some of the problems with grants, that was kind of the most essential thing for many artists for sustaining themselves was to, to get that grant money. A lot of people talked about ways that it could cover you know, living expenses and, and not be so much about the recorded output and, and see what comes from those moments. Um, so I don't think that's totally answering your question, but the, I can certainly send you um, the links that point to those stats in more details for sure. Um, yeah. Great. Anyone else? Uh, don't see any more. I, I oh, actually, did I miss anything? Oh, uh, Oliver has one. Yes, please go ahead, Oliver. Brian, what a fascinating talk. Thank you so much. Um, okay. And I'm always interested in trying to find um, ways of supporting researchers and artists in various venues. And one of the things that, um, when I worked at the Banff Center, uh, one of the cool things was to, you know, the competition to get into one of their residency programs. And then, you know, the, the food and accommodation were taken care of. So they could really just concentrate on you know, living on a thin thin line, but still they'd have a space for some period of time. Mm -hmm. Did you encounter any anything any comments about residencies and the power of giving food and accommodation? Yeah, I did. There were some artists that did point to recent grants that they had gotten that were organized in that way and how great that was. Um, and actually, some other research I was doing, not part of this project, but I was looking at the Dawson City Music Festival songwriter in residence and spoke to a number of artists who had done that and said that it was just excellent to have a no strings attached residency where you didn't have to produce anything. It was a moment to to get up there and they have a community mandate now. You have to do something in the community, um, but it's not about did you get a song out of this or an album out of this? And often they do, but maybe it comes a little bit later or maybe it's the foundations of that and, and it comes down the road. Um, so there was a, a fondness for that sort of system. Um, and the point being that things often do come from that, but it doesn't necessarily have to be in that exact moment. Um, so yes, there were, I think there was one grant in Manitoba as well that, that was doing something similar. And somebody pointed to that as an example of um, the way forward. Thank Thanks. You. Uh, Stefan has a question, or Stephen, sorry if I mispronounced. Um, uh, is there an expanded role for CRTC going forward? Yeah, that's a, a big question too. Um, 
now that a lot of my other research is kind of on the CRTC and regulation and it's a, 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 a pretty hot debate right now about what sort of role they should or shouldn't play in in kind of streaming in the world of streaming music and some big thinkers who we agree with on certain points we maybe disagree with on you know the role of things like what would CanCon be in kind of the digital or streaming era and I I don't know if I have a really sharp answer right now I think and I don't want to speak for the other researchers on the project I think that there are ways that algorithms could take into account you know, things like locality or diversity of sounds um, being less about you know keeping you tethered to the device and maybe giving you a wider range of things or you know certain options that would maybe do something like that or if we were going to move into amplifying kind of public or non-profit streaming models like that could be a place for something like the CRTC um, so that's, I really like that question. It's one I'd probably want to think about a little bit more and respond to um, after. The CRTC is the Canadian Radio Television Telecommunications Commission, and they regulate things like the airwaves, um, television, um, the Canadian content laws for different stations. So how many, uh, are you playing 35% or 40% Canadian selections throughout the broadcast week? Um, and there's a lot of debate now about should they do that for things like Netflix or Spotify and should there be a um, Canadian content for the streaming era or you know is there enough success on its own and people are going to find this on their own that's sort of how the debate is playing out um, so one thing they did yeah they haven't regulated the internet so far but they're starting to potentially move into that that realm um, although there's a lot of pushback as well and so when satellite radio came in Canada it ended up being like 10 stations per or like one per 10 Canadian to non-Canadian stations I can't remember exactly what it is now but there's about 10 to 15 kind of packaged in the 100s in the channel somewhere that are all Canadian stations um, it's not perfect but it was still something um, and that's something now that a lot of artists are saying is you know kind of paying paying fairly decent amount of money more so than terrestrial radio it seems like some of the internet based companies are doing that on their own now anyway, maybe just expecting that that's going to eventually be mandated. I, 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 I'm just speculating, but uh, Fabio had his hand up and Fabio, I'm sorry that we didn't, I didn't see it in time, but, and you, you also put your question in the chat, but would you like to ask it directly? Sure, sure, Ken. Um, it was more, can you hear me? Yep. Yes. Okay. I was, because you mentioned Brian about um, how fandom can be, Part of the process of of a fair process to assess um, whether people are uh, you know sort of like a, a good to go for grants or you know sort of like visibility boosts or institutional support. And I was wondering whether you could elaborate that a bit more in terms of where, how you assess that. And you know, I'm sure that different genres have different metrics in terms of. What, what sort of fan base they have. And I was wondering whether, I was very curious about this. Yeah, that's a great question. That's one of the, the parts of this were still, you know, it was one of those kind of comments on how might you implement something like that. And I don't, you know, we haven't really thought about should there be or what would be the right metrics for that, but maybe yeah, that, that, I mean, that is a really good question because I don't want to say that we should move away from instrumentalizing grants, but then instrumentalize grants through fandom. But it could be things like, you know, are you able to generate audiences at shows or what have you, um, that sort of thing without it being so much about certain platforms and their metrics but maybe you're able to communicate that in some way that takes into account you know, the variety of, of revenue streams or the variety of ways people interact with music these days. Um, so we could imagine all sorts of scenarios from things like a wider variety of platforms, things like maybe letters that have been written to bands or um, 
accounts of you know, particularly successful shows or festival programs or interaction with the local community in some way. So that's actually the sort of thing that you know, we're, we'd love feedback on and it's, it's one of the areas that we're still sort of thinking about and brainstorming. But it's a great question. Yeah, it's a really interesting question and, it, and there's so many aspects to it, right? Because, you know, it's, it's like the difference between like how many fans stream your music uh, to like who buys t-shirts <laughs> and stuff like that. But let's see, I think I, I don't see any other questions and we are getting close to 8.30 now. Uh, so maybe um, we can take this. I, I, I don't know if it's a tradition really, but I always, well, if, I don't know if we've actually been able to do this. Have we been able to unmute everybody, Tom? We can't really do that, can we? But anyway, I, if you're able to unmute- I can do that, I can do that. Yeah, yeah, let's do it. I mean, we should just make this into a tradition, I think. So I'm gonna put my screen in gallery mode so you can un turn on your cameras until Zoom crashes and give, uh, give Brian uh, an applause and unmute yourself and we can make some huge noise. Oh yeah, there we go, I can hear it. Very nice, very nice. <laughs> All right, so thanks everybody for coming and have a great night. And uh, the, the, as, uh, as I mentioned before, uh, we will post the video of this in coming days. Um, so stay tuned for that. And thanks again, Brian, for this great talk. Have a good night, everybody. Yeah, everyone, good, great comments. Yeah, take care.